Hello, everyone. Oh, <laughs> that's a nice surprise. Hi, Dolores. Hi, Lana. Hi, Steph. How are you tonight? Glad you're excited about the live stream. So am I. Joanne, hello. Kay, nice to see you. I'm Romano, otherwise known as Carmen. Nice to see you too. And Dolores, great to see you. And Robert Hatton, nice to see you too. Welcome. Hi, Matt. Nice to see you. Okay, so you're here because we're going to talk about the job guarantee tonight. Everybody likes the job guarantee. Stephanie had a lot to say about it in her book, but her book wasn't about the job guarantee per se. Her book was about um, MMT and the deficit myth and the MMT signature policy of the job guarantee. And Lisa um, Alagata is here and says hello and says that since she's new here, she needs help. Not sure why you need help, uh, Lisa, but I think we're a pretty friendly group here. So I think you'll probably kind of like it. Hope so anyway. So tonight we're going to review a book about the job guarantee. One of the few books about the job guarantee so far. And this is Pavlina, uh, Pavlina Cherny of his book. And Pavlina has been working on the job guarantee for years. Her thesis work was on the job guarantee. I'd say she's probably been working, uh, she's been probably been researching the job guarantee now for more than 20 years or so. And she is undoubtedly within MMT one of the leading authorities on the job guarantee. If I had to distinguish that, I would say the two leading authorities on the job guarantee are probably, well, I'd say the three leading authorities are Randy Ray and Bill Mitchell and also Pavlina Chernyva. So maybe I'm doing a disservice to Matt Forstadter here, who's been interested in the job guarantee from the very beginning of MMT and who's written a lot about it also. So I don't want to do a disservice to Matt, but certainly in recent writing, the leading figure in writing about the job guarantee has been Pavlina. B.B. Campbell says, vote for the only anti-rapist, anti-racist party, the Green Party. Uh, well, we're not unfriendly to the Green Party here. I don't know if there are any Green Party candidates in my district, except, of course, I'm sure Howie Hawkins will be on the ballot here. And if he is, it's quite likely that I might vote for Howie Hawkins, vote for the Green Party candidate. But whoever is running has to earn my vote. And so far, 
the, the two major party candidates we're looking at right now have done absolutely nothing to earn my vote. Paul McGuire says, I was about to start chapter four, but how will you pay for it? And will rest the eyes and listen in here a while instead. Hi to all. Hi, Paul. And BB says, he is awesome. Have you seen his running mate? Thank you. No, I've not seen his running mate as yet. I haven't heard who he selected as his running mate. Okay, as yet. Uh, I used to think how he was pretty good, but from what I hear today, he seems to have a Russiagate kind of problem. Joanne says, drop out Joe and Trump. I'm afraid I don't think either of them are going to drop out. I, I have still some forlorn hopes that between now and the Democratic Convention, Joe Biden will find it impossible to continue. I still have some hopes about that. But that's not what this live stream is about. What this live stream is about is the job guarantee program from the MMT perspective. And there's no one more capable of giving that view than Pavlina Cherniva. So right now we're going to review her book in some detail. And I'm going to share the screen. And I'm going to pull in her book and start with the preface. And here, of course, she talks about at first, the coronavirus pandemic and the Federal Reserve forecasting that our unemployment is going to surpass 1930s Great Depression levels. It will be another monthly unemployment report in a few days, probably be out by July 5th or so. And at that point, we'll learn what unemployment looks like um, 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 but right now. I will not venture a guess. Uh, according to my count, something like 46 million people have applied for unemployment coverage at this point. And everybody's expecting many more to come. Pavlina says this book was written before the hemorrhage in the labor market began. Yet it enumerates the many ways in which unemployment behaves like a silent epidemic. Even while the economy is humming near full employment, from the way it spreads to its uh, virulent nature, to the enormous social costs it inflicts on people, communities, and the economy. In just a few short months, these costs would be immeasurable. But nevertheless, <laughs> we will do our best to, to measure them, I think. Now, the pandemic has exposed as farcical many of the conversations from yesterday. Raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, we were told would cost jobs, as if workers in poverty were ever good for the economy. Today, it's obvious the people on whose labor we vitally depend are the very same people who cannot secure living wages and basic job protections, store clerks, dispatchers, warehouse workers, delivery drivers, and sanitation staff are now looted as essential workers, Pavlina says. But when the economy recovers, will the experts once again call them low productivity employees whose jobs are in need cave automation? Well, Pavlina is about to tell us that depends on what we do. Yesterday, most presidential hopefuls shunned the idea the government could provide universal health care. Today, we see not only that it can, but that it absolutely must, as millions lose their health insurance along with their jobs. Oh, by the way, I, I heard that a dose of rems, uh, remsdesivir uh, is being billed out at $3,200, one dose. Impossible. <laughs> uh, yesterday, economists begrudgingly admitted that despite historically low employment rates, the economy was nowhere near full employment, and millions of people still wanted good jobs. Yeah, a lot of the people who were employed in that full employment economy wanted good jobs because they had <laughs> shit jobs. Today, we face the daunting task of returning to those low rates after reaching double-digit employment. 
took more than 10 years after the great financial crisis of 2008. How long will it take now? Pavlina asks. And then she outlines what the book is about. This book critiques the conventional stabilization approaches that produce prolonged and painful jobless recoveries. And if we have to face another one, would economists insist tomorrow that we have reached a permanently high natural rate of unemployment, quote unquote? Will they rekindle the old structural unemployment excuses for the abject failure of public policy to do what it can and what is right, namely to employ the unemployed? And she comes right out and says, we need a job guarantee now more than ever. And, of course, the following pages in the book present the case for the overwhelming benefits and a blueprint for the implementation of the job guarantee. And that, of course, is what you're here to hear about, to talk about. Um, decades of austerity have led to the erosion of essential public sector programs services and institutional capacities, leaving us woefully unprepared to respond to this pandemic and the social crisis that will follow. The public was baited into accepting austerity with the myth that the federal government could run out of funding. And yet almost overnight, the U.S. government passed an unprecedented $2.2 trillion package to tackle the pandemic. Remember, Obama's big deal expense to meet the crisis of 2008 was a mere $787 billion stimulus bill. But overnight, the U.S. government passed an unprecedented $2.2 trillion package to tackle the pandemic with additional spending on the way, according to a bipartisan consensus. That bipartisan consensus has not gotten to anything and it, it's not very hopeful at this point that it's going to get to anything that's good. But that remains to be seen. And also the pressure we will put on to make a good thing happen uh, also remains to be seen. But people are going to be getting pretty desperate as July rolls on. And as you know, it's now June 29th. Uh, so tomorrow, when politicians ask, but how will the government pay for this program? The answer should always be, quote, the way we paid for the pandemic. If we can pay for all the interventions necessary to stem this crisis, we surely can afford to guarantee jobs, homes, health care, and a green economy. What we cannot afford is to emerge out of this moment with the same economic problems and inequalities that created so much suffering and devastation even before the current um, um, pandemic. <laughs> so, Paulina starts her introduction with a quote from Seneca. It is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that they are difficult. That sounds like a candidate, like a quote John Kennedy might have used, doesn't it? Quote, there are no guarantees in life unquote, is a familiar frame, as is, quote again, if you really want something, you have to work for it. But what if what you really want is paid work, a decent, well-paid job? And what if you cannot find it because, well, there are no guarantees in life? This is the paradox the job guarantee proposal aims to solve. It is a public policy that provides an employment opportunity on standby to anyone looking for work no matter their personal circumstances or the state of the economy. It converts the unemployment offices into employment offices to provide voluntary public service work opportunities in a wide range of care, environmental rehabilitation, and small infrastructure projects. The job guarantee, says Pavlina, is a public option for jobs. I think that's a great meme it's one we should always use, that we want a public option for jobs. Uh, the guarantee part of the proposal is the promise, the assurance that a basic job offer will always be available to those who seek it. The job part deals with another paradox.
namely that while paid work in the modern world is life-defining indispensable, it has for many become elusive, um, iris, and punitive. The job component and the job guarantee aims to change all that by establishing a decent living wage job. A living wage job, folks. A living wage job as a standard for all jobs in the economy while paving the way for the transformation of public policy, the nature of the work experience, and the meaning of work itself. I think that's very well put. I again want to emphasize living wage, living wage. That is the promise of this idea. That is the promise of this particular legislation or legislative proposal or policy. A living wage job guarantee. Not a less than living wage job guarantee. Not a starvation wage job guarantee. Pavlini continues, the job guarantee deals with two very specific aspects of economic insecurity, unemployment, intermittent or long-term, and poorly paid employment. Uh, that is to say, precarious and unequal. There are other labor market pro problems, such as wage theft, discrimination, poverty, and stagnant income growth. Then there are other forms of economic insecurity too, such as a lack of affordable and qual high quality food, care, housing, and education, or a lack of protection from the ravages of climate change. While in a certain sense, the job guarantee has a narrow and clear mission to provide a decent job, a decent pay to all job seekers who come and knocking. By its very nature and design, it addresses a wide range of social and economic problems and helps deliver a fair economy. At bottom, the job guarantee is a policy of care, one that fundamentally rejects the notion that people in economic distress, communities in disrepair, and an environment in peril are the unfortunate but unavoidable collateral, collateral damage of a market economy. Another very, very important statement and one to keep in mind. Pavlina continues, the idea of using public policy to guarantee the right to employment is not new. Its long life and resilience stem from its deep moral content. It was affirmed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's proposed Economic Bill of Rights. It was a signature issue in the struggle for civil rights, and it is etched into many nations' constitutions, inspired by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But its mandate remains unmet. In the United States, the architects of the 1946 Employment Act and the 1978 Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act tried but ultimately fail to implement appropriate legislation to secure it. In the absence of a universal right to work, intermittent direct employment programs around the world have attempted, however imperfectly, to fill the void, many with perceptible success. Today, the job guarantee has been hailed as, quote, the single most crucial aspect of the Green New Deal. Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal, Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal. The Green New Deal of the Sunrise Movement, conveying that environmental justice cannot be delivered without economic and social justice. The Green New Deal and the Job Guarantee aim to resolve two seemingly distinct, but in fact organically inseparable, existential problems those of climate change and economic insecurity. What good is a green future in which the dangers of global warming have abated, but families and whole communities continue to experience deaths of despair due to poverty, unemployment, and economic distress? 
And what kind of economy would it be which made well pay jobs available to all, but continue to exploit and devastate the natural environment on which we vitally depended? Although the job guarantee predates the Green New Deal, it has always been green from the days of Roosevelt's tree army to modern proposals like the one outlined in this book, prioritizing environmental conservation and community renewal. The Green New Deal is an ambitious policy agenda. I thought that was a very important statement too, that the Green New Deal has always been green. The Green New Deal is an ambitious policy agenda designed to transform the economy and deliver a habitable planet to future generations. The job guarantee embeds economic and social justice into the scientific response to climate change. It embeds economic justice, social justice, climate justice. It is an indispensable part of the green agenda that would ensure that no one would be left behind in the transition, but is also a transformative macroeconomic policy and safety net that would tackle decades long labor market problems along with the dislocations that would emerge from the greening process. Put simply, the job guarantee ensures that while we work to protect the environment and transform the economy, we have a policy that protects working people and transforms the work experience itself. So Pavlina here is throwing down the gauntlet. The job guarantee has to protect working people and transform the work experience itself. Ambitious, right? This book presents the job guarantee proposal and explains why it is critical to the climate movement. It also contends that even after the Green New Deal has fulfilled its mission, a market economy would still require a job guarantee. This is because the program serves as an ongoing shock absorber and a powerful tool for economic stabilization, which is perhaps its most critical macroeconomic feature. It was absent in the era of industrialization when paid work became the indispensable yet unreliable ticket to securing a livelihood. It was missing in the post-war era when economic depressions were banished, but unemployment was not expelled along with them. And it is lacking today when neoliberal policies have weakened core worker rights while policymakers stabilize prices on the backs of the unemployed. The job guarantee is a policy that was needed well before we irreversibly polluted the environment. And it is one that will still be necessary after we have cleaned it up. The vision for the job guarantee articulated here connects job creation to environmental conservation. It also defines green policies as those that address all forms of waste and the devastation, including and especially those of our human resources. A green policy must remedy the neglect and squander that come with economic distress, unemployment, and precarious work in particular. As the late Nobel Prize winning economist uh, William Vickery argued, unemployment is at best equivalent to vandalism, quote unquote, bringing an unconscionable toll and ruin on individuals, families, and communities. Yet conventional wisdom considers unemployment to be normal, quote unquote. The economists even call it, quote, natural, unquote, and devise policies around some, quote, optimal, unquote, level of joblessness. The idea that involuntary unemployment is an unfortunate but unavoidable occurrence and that there is an appropriate level of unemployment necessary for the smooth function of the economy is among the great unexamined myths of our time. It is also bad economics. To make the case for the job guarantee policy, the book begins with a thought experiment before moving on to the diagnosis and economic analysis. It asks the reader to imagine what the job guarantee policy might look like in very practical terms and the impact it might have on unemployed people and their families. We consider under those circumstances, someone might, might need to access the program. 
and what kinds of projects could ensure that they would always walk out of the unemployment office with a basic living wage offer. The reason for this approach is that unemployment has become far too abstract and paradoxically impersonal. Few things are as personal as losing one job, losing one's job. And yet most economists and policymakers talk about unemployment much like uh, 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 the meteorologists talk about the weather. Unemployment is treated as if it were a natural occurrence about which governments can do little beyond providing temporary protection like unemployment insurance. Uh, millions might have to endure joblessness as the economy slogs through a prolonged recession. But when the weather clears, unemployment will dissipate again. It's still, the inevitable drumbeat of globalization and technological change dictates that some people will necessarily stay structurally unemployed. Well, so the story goes. Unemployment is thus depersonified and internalized as a tolerable natural occurrence in a globalized world. It has become common to personify it only when unemployed people are blamed for their own lot. Um, another myth this book aims to debunk. Now, by the way, this myth is actually fairly recent. When I was growing up and people were unemployed or lost their jobs, it was in the aftermath of the New Deal and World War II. And people then no longer believed that when people were unemployed, it was their fault. At that time, um, but they believed, as they ought to believe now, that it was a failure of the economic system that had driven people into unemployment. That was the truth of the Depression, and people still remembered that truth. People forgot about that during the 80s and during the 90s, and the old myth that unemployment was the fault of the individual rose again. When economic conditions are favorable, unemployment and poverty are often believed to be the result of poor initiative, like job seekers have not upgraded their skill, or some other individual moral failing, substance abuse, criminal record, bad choices, quote, unquote, of one kind or another. Unemployment is thereby reanimated, but not humanized. Some readers may share this view, and it, it is hoped this book will change their minds. Even in the best of times, decent job opportunities are in short supply for a great many people due to stacked circumstances beyond their control. The consequences are devastating, yet largely avoidable. The questions I want to raise are these. What if we devised a system that rain or shine, quote, moral failings, unquote, or not? Guarantee job opportunities. <laughs> Excuse me. To anyone who wanted to work, irrespective of their experience, training, or personal situation, what would such an economy look like? Would the sky fall? Would it create economic conditions and consequences worse than the ones we already face? Or would it usher in a great many benefits that we may have not have considered before? Would a world with a public option for jobs be any worse than one in which even the good economy, quote unquote, leaves millions without decent employment? Or would it provide a new basis for economic security and stability? To begin answering these questions, chapter one makes a very simple proposal to ensure that the unemployment offices, the so-called American job centers, begin to act as genuine employment offices that provide Living Wage, Public Service Employment Opportunities on Demand. Chapter 2 documents the many catch-22 situations unemployed people face um, in the labor market. It challenges us to think of the right to a job in the same way we think of the right to retirement security or the right to primary and secondary education. Modern fine-tuning policies, uh, both the monetary and fiscal, that treat unemployment as, quote, natural, unquote, and, quote, unavoidable, unquote, 
perpetrate the above mentioned vandalism on people, communities, and the environment. Once we take into account its social, economic, and environmental costs, it becomes clear that unemployment is already paid for and the price tag is high. Chapter three argues that guaranteeing employment represents a new social contract and macroeconomic stabilization policy that falls within a long tradition of government guarantees. By combining key features of other public options and price support schemes, the job guarantee would have transformative effects on the economy. It would establish a new labor standard with an uncompromising living wage floor for all working people while stabilizing employment, inflation, and government spending more effectively than current practice. It would also replace once and for all unemployment as an economic stabilizer. The chapter enumerates the other benefits of the job guarantee, including but not limited to its impact on state budgets, inequality, service sector employment, and the lives of those who do not seek um, but paid work. Um, addressing the question of cost, chapter four provides the reader with a new perspective on affordability and sheds light on why most guarantees are usually provided by the federal government. This chapter considers the economic meaning of the term, quote, the power of the public purse, unquote, and separates the real from the financial costs, as well as the real resource constraints from the artificial financial constraints. It also provides estimates of the size of the job guarantee budget and presents the results from a macroeconomic simulation of the program's impact on the U.S. economy. Chapter five turns to the question of implementation and design and explains how the proposal offered here differs from others. It illustrates why the job guarantee is inherently great and provides examples of specific projects that could be developed and managed using a decentralized and participatory model. Note that, decentralized and participatory. That means people involved in the program will participate in shaping it, in creating it, in shaping it, in implementing it, in carrying it forward. It recommends that the job guarantee is organized as a National Care Act that prioritizes care for the environment, care for the people, and care for the communities. The chapter also addresses some frequently asked questions and highlights important lessons from similar real-world job creation programs. Concluding chapter six evaluates the program's overwhelming popularity and symbiotic relationship with the Green New Deal. It clarifies the different uses of guaranteeing jobs, quote unquote, that can be found in the climate discourse and situates the job guarantee proposal within the green agenda. It also explains why the job guarantee would still be needed in a zero emissions world where temperatures are stabilized and concludes with some thoughts about its role and place in the international policy architecture. So, on to chapter one. Of course, the job guarantee is a public option for good jobs. Pavlina starts, it took 11 long years after the great financial crisis to bring the U.S. unemployment rate to a new post-war low of 3.5%. Still, there were millions of people who could not find paid work. The official figure in February 2020 was 5.8 million, but with a proper count, that number would be more than doubled, yes. And here what she's talking about is uh, the broader measure would include people who want to work but are not counted because they didn't look for work in the survey week or those who work part-time because they cannot find full-time work. Uh, for details, see uh, E.G. Uh, uh, Flavia Dantes and L. Randall Ray, quote, full employment, are we there yet, unquote. A piece from the Levy Economic Institute, Public Policy Brief, number 142. And the year was 2017. 
Job loss is not an affliction that touches everyone equally. It disproportionately affects the young, the poor, individuals with disabilities, people of color, veterans, and former inmates. Growth, we are told, will raise all boats, but drawn out jobless recoveries have been the norm for half a century now. And jobs have increasingly failed to deliver good pay. When we consider the question, when the economy grows, who gains? We find a disturbing answer. In the immediate postal era, as economies expanded after each recession, the vast majority of the gains went to the bottom 90% of families. The exact opposite has been true in the last four expansions. Figure one, that's in footnote two. Since the 1980s, a growing economy primarily grew the incomes of the wealthiest 10% of families. Worse, during the uh, during uh, oh, the recovery from the Great Recession, average real incomes for the bottom 90% of families fell in the first three years of the expansion. Let's see where this goes. That's from Pavlina's article, Reorienting Fiscal Policy, a Bottom-Up Approach. Figure one is right here. There it is. And you can see the different periods, the recovery from 1949 to 53, huge share went to the bottom 90%. In each recovery since then, a smaller share has gone to the bottom 90% and a larger share to the top 10%. But things got really bad during the Reagan period when the top 10% got only a 20% share, the top 10% got an 80% share. Things were a little better during the recovery of 1991 to 2000. That was most of the Clinton period. Uh, but things did get a little better, maybe 25% for the bottom 90%. But uh, the top 10% was still at 75% share. Then in the 2001 to 2007 recovery period, almost everything, 98 or 99%, According to the graph, went to the top uh, about ten percent, and maybe one to two percent went to uh, the bottom ninety percent. Then the two thousand nine and two thousand twelve period, the bottom ninety percent actually lost money, and the top uh, about ten percent actually gained. 114 percent or 115 percent according to the graphic that particular graphic was created by Pavlina. simple graphic but very effective today millions of people cannot find paid work and millions more need above poverty pay wages have stagnated for decades Real average income for the bottom 90% of families was 34,580 in 2017. 2.2% .2 lower than it was 20 years uh, uh, um, earlier, that is in 1997. So the last part of the Clinton period, the whole Obama administration and the whole Bush administration served uh, to lower the real average income of the bottom 90%. Meanwhile, real average income of the richest 0.01% of families grew by 60.5% during the same period and was nearly 556 times higher than that of the bottom 90% or a thousand times higher if we include capital gains.
And there's a table on that, okay, in the book. Very striking, isn't it? Top 10% gained 24.2%. Top 1% gained 33.3%. Top 0.01% gained 60.5%. But the bottom 90% lost 2.2%. Behind the unemployment and inequality numbers hide the millions of different faces, experiences, circumstances, and personal challenges of those dealing with joblessness and inadequate pay. <coughs> Maybe you are one of them and you know someone who is. Maybe you lost your job in the Great Recession and are now working two part-time jobs, struggling to pay the bills. Maybe you graduated high school, cannot afford college and looking to save some money first. Maybe the children have fled the nest and you, the stay-at-home parent, would like to find paid work, but it has been decades since your last job and you don't know where to begin. Maybe you sent out 215 resumes already, but even in this, quote, strong economy, unquote, you still cannot find stable, well-paid work. Maybe it's because of your age, gender, the color of your skin, or your criminal record. Maybe you're someone with a disability who wishes to work, but getting the kinds of jobs you could do seems impossible. And if you do get one, the current law allows your employer to pay you as little as $1 an hour. I gather that's for service jobs of certain kinds. Maybe the firm found a better, quote unquote, candidate. You keep knocking on the next door, emailing the next employer, but the call never comes. The unemployment office is here to help you take additional classes, spruce up your resume, and practice your interview skills. You put your best foot forward, but strike out again. Or maybe you are hired, but it's only another low-paying job with no benefits. You barely make ends meet, and a long commute and unpredictable shifts may coming home for dinner or doing homework with kids a challenge. That was very well put, wasn't it, folks? Very well written. A driving passage. You're willing to work hard for that job, but the job just isn't working for you. This time, you are lucky. Remember 2009, the overcrowded unemployment offices and the many online ads that said, quote, the unemployed need not apply, unquote. But maybe you are none of the above people. Maybe you have an okay job, at least compared to your friends. The pay is not great, but the firm promises opportunities for advancement. You can provide for the family, and after a few more months, you'll finally earn that two-week paid vacation. The only problem is that your boss harasses you mercilessly, but you stick around. Could you really give up this stable job? And you are so close, you can almost smell the ocean. Maybe you live in Puerto Rico, and your shop was swept away by Hurricane Maria. Many people died. Uh, Many more fled. And a year and a half later, one in 12 people on the island was still looking for work. Or maybe you escaped the California fires, but you lost your job and the FEMA money for your incinerated home is running out. You and many others in flood and tornado ravaged areas still need to pay the bills and local communities still need rebuilding. How many of these stories can we tell? In the U.S., millions. Globally, hundreds of millions. The loss of one's job and livelihood is not just a consequence of unusual circumstances or, quote, acts of God, unquote. (laughs) It is a regular occurrence. The drumbeat of the economy, expanding in good times and shrinking in bad, (coughs) along with outsourcing and technological change, creates ongoing job losses. And while new employment opportunities are also created, They're never enough for all job seekers, even at the peak of expansions. Meanwhile, many workers are in unstable, poorly paid jobs. In 2018, there were 6.9 million working people earning below the official poverty level. For millions of Americans, one job is just not enough. So much then for the 40-hour week, right? What if we changed all that and made it a social and economic objective that no job seeker would be left without, at a minimum, decent living wage work? What would be the impact on the lives of people, communities, and the economy? Um, um, uh, Imagine that you go back to the unemployment office, (coughs) but this time, in addition to every other resource it offers, 
It also produces a list of local public service jobs, each offering a basic wage, say $15 an hour. Let's not say $15 an hour, folks. Let's say $20 an hour. $15 an hour was new and attractive about back in 2012 when it first was mentioned. That was eight years ago, folks. How about $20 an hour? How about cost adjusted $20 an hour all over the country based on the CPI in the area in which you live? That's the basic wage. That's a living wage. Health care and affordable quality child care. You can choose from full and part-time options as it does now. The office continues to offer additional wraparound services, including training, credentialing, GED, GED completion, family-focused case management, transportation subsidies, counseling, referrals, and others. There are local job opportunities um, in the municipality or local nonprofits. Finally, a shorter commute. But they are federally funded. Not that you care. A paycheck is a paycheck. The Urban Fishery is starting a new STEM program with local schools. The Historical Society is uh, uh, digitizing its maps and records. The Green New Deal has launched a comprehensive uh, weatherization program and green infrastructure projects abound. The project is hiring for that water pipe replacement that dragged on for years and the cleanup of the vacant lot behind uh, the municipal park needs workers. Local community groups are running outreach programs for veterans, the homeless at risk youths and former inmates and community health clinics are offering apprenticeships and training opportunities. A community theater is running after school programs for children and evening classes for um, um, adults. All these jobs were either non-existent or the projects were sorely understaffed before the job guarantee was launched. If your community has been battered by extreme weather disasters or environmental hazards, the program will help staff the cleanup and rebuilding efforts and the region's revitalized fire and flood prevention programs. And this entire menu of options is organized and supplied courtesy of the job guarantee. It is a program in cooperation with local and uh, um, uh, um, also municipal governments and local nonprofit providers to ensure that no job seeker is ever turned away. The job guarantee office is there to help you transition uh, to um, the better paid employment opportunities in the private or public sectors. The economy is growing and new job ads promise opportunities for advancement, flexible hours, and telecommuting. With your additional experience and training, you line up some job offers. You say goodbye to the job guarantee and are off to the next opportunity. Or maybe you do not need the job guarantee at all. After all, you are a highly educated and skilled individual with an entirely different professional experience. Uh, you, your career ladder is clear, your contacts are many, and you're able to jump from one opportunity to the next with ease. You earn a good income, provide for your family, and would never consider or likely need to apply for the job guarantee. But the program has helped uh, to rehabilitate your neighborhood, build community gardens in your kids' schools, organize new programs and community events in the local library, and restored near uh, the nearby hiking trails and public beaches. Can this become a realistic uh, scenario? Can we put in place a program that provides a basic employment safety net for those who need it while creating much needed community work that benefits everyone in every state and every county, no matter how small or how remote? Subsequent chapters will argue that the answer is yes and that we already know a lot of, about how to make it happen. Such a program would uh, bring overwhelming benefits, economic, social, and environmental. Maybe these stories uh, by resonate, and you can see the impact the public job option could have. With a job guarantee, you could find local work in a community project that matter to you. You could say no to an abusive employer if you had a living wage alternative. But let's emphasize again, living wage alternative. You could get a starter job as between before moving on to other opportunities and save yourself the frustration of being rejected time and again by employers who may not like your sparse resume. 
you would be able to avoid the stress of applying for food stamps and other government programs because you have a living wage job and can make ends meet. We are here just scratching the surface of the difference a job guarantee could make to the lives of the millions of people behind the unemployment and underemployment uh, numbers. But maybe these stories do not resonate. It just sounds too good to be true. Isn't there something called the, quote, natural unemployment rate, unquote? What can the government really do about it? Can it even create jobs? And if it tried, wouldn't it distort um, the market incentives? Maybe you worry that people wouldn't work as hard if they weren't afraid of being unemployed. Or that the program would ruin productivity. And how much would it cost? Isn't it very expensive to hire millions of people? All of these concerns and more are addressed in the following pages. The economics of unemployment is bad economics. One need not share the personal distress unemployed people and their families face to understand that hiring those willing to work is a much better economic approach than the one we have at present. Reaching that understanding is the task of the next uh, chapter. Okay, and that is, of course, chapter two. And we'll go on with it now. A steep price for a broken status quo. The economics of employment is straightforward. A person will find a job if someone's willing to hire them. Typically, we think of firms doing all the hiring because they comprise about 80% of total employment in the U.S. And firm hiring depends on profitability. If customers are walking in the door, cash registers are ringing and profits are rising, then firms will hire. And when sales and profits decline, uh, mass layoffs result. But about a fifth of all jobs are created not for monetary gain per se, but in order to meet some specific public purpose. Roads must be maintained, schools must be staffed, food and drugs must be inspected, security and justice must be provided. Nonprofit, local, state, and federal government employment is devoted to serving the broader public interest. The argument put forth here is that hiring the involuntarily unemployed serves an important public purpose of its own, one that has been neglected largely because unemployment has been accepted as unavoidable, and even worse, as necessary for economic stability. How, quote, natural, unquote, is unemployment? Suppose you heard that in a strong economy, the optimal level of children <coughs> who wanted to, but were unable to receive primary and secondary education was 5%. Or that was a natural level, or that there was a natural level of starvation equal to 5% of the population, or that 5% of people would ideally remain without shelter. Modern societies have arrived at the moral position that policy should do all it can to eradicate uh, illiteracy, hunger, and homelessness. Without question, we can and must do much better in doing so. But we do not design or implement policy on the basis that there is some optimal level for these social ills. Our aspirations and ethical commitments are to guarantee access to schooling, food, and shelter to all. Yet economists regularly talk about unemployment in these terms. It's something that's not only inevitable, but also necessary for the smooth functioning of the economy and formulate policies on the premise that there is a, quote, natural, unquote, level of unemployment. This was succinctly put by Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, in January of 2019, quote, we need the concept of a natural rate of unemployment. We need to have some sense of when the unemployment is high, low, or just right, unquote. What is, quote, uh, oh, what is the, quote, right, unquote, number of people are struggling to find paid work? Many economists fear that if unemployment is too low and labor markets are too tight, quote, unquote, then firms will have to raise wages to attract workers and in turn raise prices to recover those costs. Low unemployment, the argument goes, could cause high or even accelerating inflation, producing one of the clunkiest concepts in economics, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, the NIRU. You heard about the NIRU when we were talking about Stephanie's book, of course. Inflation fighting central banks then aim to fine tune the economy around the Nairu. Countless think tanks, academics, and government institutions spend valuable resources 
on trying to identify this elusive, quote, um, optimal level, unquote, of unemployment, while the actual number of unemployed people yo-yos around as the economy grows and slows down. And the CBO has maintained that the natural level throughout the postal era was between 4.5% and 6.5%. And yet, here we are today with official unemployment at 3.5%. It is no consolation that Chairman Powell recently admitted under oath that the unemployment inflation relationship has collapsed. I don't think it ever really existed. The search for the Nairu continues. Top economists vigorously defend it, and the Fed's explicit objective is to manage inflation by slowing down the rate of investment and hiring when unemployment gets too low, quote unquote. The trouble with this fine tuning approach is threefold. First, the Nairu is a myth. The economists and the Fed cannot figure out the nature of the unemployment inflation relationship, nor whether it is even a causal one. And then she refers to an article by Olivier Blanchard, should, quote, should we reject the natural rate hypothesis, unquote. That's from the Journal of Economic Perspectives in 2018. He was the former chief economist, and I forget, either the World Bank or the IMF. But anyway, he's big shot in economics in the large institutions he was. Uh, now he's back to play in academia. And even he, who defended the natural rate hypothesis for years, asks, poses the question, should we reject the natural rate hypothesis. The trouble with this five-tuning approach is threefold. First, the Nairu is a myth. Economists in the Fed cannot figure out the nature of the unemployment inflation uh, relationship, nor whether it is even a causal one. Second, on its own admission, the Fed has no reliable theory of inflation either. Third, despite failing to pin down the Nairu or the inflation target Fed officials have been insisting at least since 2014 that the economy has reached full employment. Many will remember a similar experience in the 1990s when experts kept warning the economy has reached uh, the maximum employment, even as the unemployment rate kept breaking through every official, new official Nairu estimate with no accelerating inflation in sight. And like a scene from Groundhog Day, with Nairu warnings on repeat, the unemployed people are caught in a jobless trap with no way out. Uh, okay, what's going on, of course, is that the economists have been seeing the hypothesis that there is a Nairu falsified again and again and again and again in the last uh, about 30 years. And you see them keep trying to save the hypothesis uh, by saying, oh, we were wrong about the estimate, but the Nairu is still there. After your estimates are wrong about 30 times, it's appropriate to ask the question, is there a Nairu or is it a myth? Is the theory behind the Nairu? Is the theory wrong? This problem is worse around the world. In 2012, the annual um, economic forecast of the European Commission claimed the natural rate of unemployment in Spain was 26.6%. The economy simply could not do better. And yet it did, as unemployment fell, granted um, insufficiently. From its depression levels, the commission kept revising down its own Nairu estimates. It is hard not to conclude that the Nairu has provided cover for the profound policy failure of tackling unemployment head on. This was not always the view from the Fed, says Pavlina. In 1945, the Board of Governors put together a comprehensive report on the maintenance of full employment um, but production and living standards during the transition from a wartime to peacetime economy, arguing that the, quote, two evils 
unemployment and inflation, will not cancel out and both must be prevented. The Fed outlined a sweeping long-term program for full employment and price stability that included a series of measures, among which the guarantee of employment was considered perhaps the most essential part of the concept of a national minimum standard. That was an article from Emanuel A. Goldenweiser et al., Jobs Production and Living Standards, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, uh, U.S. Postwar um, Economic Studies, August of 1945. Those were the days, my friends. The Fed argued that this guarantee was the first clause in a bill of economic rights. Someone still remembered Franklin Roosevelt in August of 1945. Well, he'd only been dead a few months. And that a fuller and better utilization of our, or had been, I'm sorry, I think he died in, No, I think it was March 45 that he died. That a fuller, better utilization of our resources, human material for the benefit of all, was a central national economic goal of the Federal Reserve itself. The, the Fed's approach could not be more different today. Um, um, unemployment, no, I take that back. He died in 1944. I remember that. The reason why I remember his dying in 1944 was my favorite uncle died in 1944. Uh, uh, he was in the Navy and his boat, it was a boat uh, that was made by the Kaiser Company uh, for shipping it broke apart in a terrible storm off the coast of England. And he could not get to shore. And he died in the water. And this was just about the same time that Roosevelt died. Uh, uh, at, at Warm Springs, Georgia. Both deaths are closely intertwined in my mind. Because I was right there when my grandmother got uh, the news that uh, her son, my favorite uncle, died. Four weeks after my brother was born, and as was the custom in Jewish families, uh, he was named after someone um, who recently died. So there are a number of events, confluence of events, which means it was 1944. Uh, the, Fred's, the Fed's approach could not be more different uh, today. Employment is sanctioned by government policy the Nairu has been used to rationalize policy responses that permit okay, the deliberate slowing down of the economy and the increase of joblessness to tame inflationary pressures, thus reinforcing the existence of much um, um, economic hardship. But unemployment is not at all um, unavoidable, and direct measures to wipe it out are the superior policy option. Before we reckon with the high costs of the status quo, however, we need to address another pervasive myth, the idea that jobs are abundant and unemployment is an individual failure. And our next section is called the labor market, a catch-22 for many. It is a common view that in a strong economy, anyone who looks for work will be able to find it. Oh, by the way, wasn't that last section really, really good? I thought it was. I think so far this is another terrific book. It is a common view that in a strong economy, anyone who looks for work will be able to find it. Any difficulties they might have must therefore be due to some personal shortcoming. This, of course, is the neoliberal view, folks. A lack of required skills, inadequate education, or poor incentives in decision-making. Of course, 
For most economists, quote, full employment, unquote, actually refers to a situation where millions of people are involuntarily out of work, whether through personal fail failings or not, not to a situation where anyone who is ready, willing, and able to work could actually secure a job. And this graphic shows uh, job openings, total non-farm, and the number came unemployed in thousands. from the period 2000 to what looks like 2019 in the beginning of 2019 okay at the end you can see the spike okay unemployment from the great uh, uh, recession and long, long, long recovery to close to full employment. You can see that. There are always lots of jobs going to begging. These were Pavlina's calculations based on data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. In reality, even if one makes all the right decisions, the labor market is not a fair game. Even at the peak of an expansion, there are always more job seekers than there are job openings. For many people, the labor market is riddled with, a paradox, with paradoxical catch-22 situations. The for-profit sector creates the vast majority of employment opportunities but it is not in the business of hiring everyone who wants to work. As noted, firms hire staff when their sales and profits uh, justify it. But there are many other reasons apart from division sales why they never employ all of the unemployed. First, firms do not like to hire unemployed people, and especially the long-term unemployed. They prefer to hire people already working or have smaller gaps in their work experience. For the unemployed, this is a catch-22. During the Great uh, Recession, as we noted above, some job ads even warned the unemployed need not apply, a practice that was challenged in U.S. courts. Furthermore, firms are reluctant to hire long-term unemployed people because they consider nine months of unemployment to be equivalent to four years of lost work experience. For many, the mark of unemployment is their main obstacle to securing a good job. Firms try to avoid the risk of hiring and training them which produces a modern paradox, an economy in which millions are seeking work while firms fret over finding qualified workers. This paradox is made worse by the fact that as the economy grows, firms tighten their hiring criteria. This means that those who need to find work the most are long-term unemployed are precisely those facing the highest barriers to entry. Not only are they hired last and fired first and so unable to build up sufficient work experience, gain job tenure, or grow their incomes. They're most likely to be liked out of, an, um, of employment opportunities altogether when employers change the rules of the game. It is another catch-22. Training and education do not resolve this paradox, though they may shuffle people around on the unemployment line. Over the last few decades, higher education has delivered soaring student loans, but not the jobs and incomes to pay them off. Like a Sisyphean boulder, Crushing student debt has meant that young people are not able to afford a home, get married, or retain enough discretionary income, putting the brakes on economic growth, another catch-22. Even with training programs, private firms have other criteria, visible and invisible, for exclusion. Uh, at discrimination on the basis of gender, race, age, and sex are well-documented. Stay-at-home parents are about as half as likely to receive a second interview as unemployed parents and only about one-third as likely as employed parents. African-American applicants without a criminal record are called back with an offer of a job or a second interview less frequently than white applicants with a criminal record. P 
people with disabilities are systematically locked out of employment opportunities and have been the last group to see their employment rates reach pre-crisis level. And there, from 1948 to 2018, is the variability in percent of unemployment. And you can see the recession at the end of the Carter period and the beginning K, the Reagan period. Uh, that was a huge unemployment statistic there and only slightly lower uh, during the recession of 2000. Okay, and eight. Uh, so. The human yo-yo effect, that's called. All these challenges in the labor market coupled with an economy that regularly lays off millions of people during recessions have created a human yo-yo effect. Unemployment in the U.S. is extremely volatile. It starts with an avalanche of mass layoffs and recessions, but recoveries are slow and anemic. Jobless uh, recoveries have been accepted as normal and unavoidable. In the meantime, the share of long-term Unemployment and local unemployment has steadily risen since the 1960s. Unemployment, in a sense, creates unemployability. And the labor market is a cruel game of musical chairs. In fact, it is worse because many unemployed people cannot find a chair, i.e. paid work. And if they do, especially in the low-wage sectors, they often discriminate against, harassed, subject to wage theft, and under constant threat of losing their jobs and benefits. There are not enough jobs, but there are not enough good jobs either. The policy of maintaining a reserve pool of the unemployed, the stacked obstacles, the jobless face in the la the stacked obstacles, the jobless face in the labor market, and the human yo-yo effect of mass layoffs all inflict high costs on society and the economy. Unemployment is expensive, just like we do not talk about the optimal level of homelessness or um, illiteracy. The notion of optimal unemployment would not survive long if economists took full account of its social and economic costs. A wealth of research from psychology, the cognitive sciences, and public health indicates the cost of unemployment, poorly paid employment, unstable and erratic employment, and involuntary part-time employment are simply staggering. This suggests that we should think of unemployment and precarious employment as a disease, at once vicious, chronic, and deadly. What one will not see by looking at the official numbers is that unemployment spreads like a virus. To get a sense of how it moves, it is useful to observe an animated geographical map of unemployment over time. I guess I'll leave it to you to follow that down. It's on YouTube. It's an uh, animated map okay, for the U.S. created by Flowing Data. So look up uh, Flowing Data on YouTube. And you can get it there. It's an animated map of unemployment. The first thing one notices is that persistent joblessness, often in the double digits, even during um, economic booms, does not just plague the Rust Belt and the Appalachian Mountains, but also affects countless communities from the Sierra Nevada to the Colorado Plains, the coast ranges, and the deep south. The second um, notable feature is that unemployment presents an unmistakable contagion effect. Imagine throwing the pebble into water. The initial shock creates ripples that move further and further away. This is what happens with unemployment. When recessions hit, mass layoffs and distressed areas spread and multiply like a disease from community to community the loss of income and jobs for those who are laid off to drastically causes those who are laid off to drastically reduce their spending, which impacts neighboring businesses who respond in turn by laying off other workers and on and on it goes. In a sense, one unemployed person throws another one out of work. Unemployment spreads like a disease in recessions while in expansions it lingers in the epicenters of these outbreaks, creating chronic um, economic distress. Figure four gives a snapshot of the situation after the Great Recession, showing double-digit unemployment rates across the country well into the recovery. 
something one cannot see by looking only at the official aggregate unemployment of the statistics. And you see how the unemployment spread in 2009 to 2010, in 2011. Then the areas start to get somewhat lighter again. But it takes a long time for it to get back to the level of lightness in 2008. A long time. Okay, the dark in these maps is it's a local area unemployment rate of greater than 10%. The unemployed suffer a permanent loss of lifetime of earnings and incur significant health costs. They are sicker, make more trips to the doctor, and spend more uh, when it comes to medication. They have higher rates of alcoholism, physical illness, depression, and anxiety. Uh, this is the case around the world as well. According to a metadata study that examined several variables of mental health, including mixed symptoms of distress, depression, anxiety, psychosomatic symptoms, subjective well-being, and self-esteem. All of these combined and complex health effects create a vicious cycle that makes it harder for unemployed people to re-enter the labor market. Joblessness, it turns out, is its own catch-22 creating the difficult personal and health co conditions that prevent a person from escaping it. This paradox is made worse by the fact that unemployment drastically and permanently reduces a person's social capital and participation, cutting them off from social networks and relations that are for many the bridge to re-employment. The isolation that unemployment brings is compounded by other well-documented scarring effects, such as a permanent decline in well-being which linger, linger even after a person has been re-employed. One study found that of the total cost of unemployment, the non-monetary costs are between 85 and 93%, overwhelming the costs of a permanent loss of income. This suggests, this suggests that policies which mainly focus on providing income to the unemployed would be inadequate. It should not come as a surprise, though it is altogether ignored by the research on the, quote, natural rate of unemployment, that unemployment harms not just those who have lost their jobs, but also their families. Unemployment is among the causes of malnutrition, growth, stunting, mental health problems, poor education, and labor market outcomes, and reduced social mobility of spouses and children. In the U.S., children experience the highest poverty rate, and 80% of poor children live in a family without a working uh, adult. 80% of poor children. Unemployment contributes to the entrenched urban blight and economic uh, destitution in many communities and is a factor in violent and property crimes. Youth unemployment, crime, and right-wing extremism are strongly correlated. And globally, many countries are experiencing obstinate depression levels of youth unemployment, a ticking time bomb of social problems. In the U.S., unemployment among formerly incarcerated individuals is more than five times the national rate, higher than in the worst years of the Great um, Depression, while unemployment is a major factor in recidivism. Beyond the personal costs, there are also broader um, impacts on the macroeconomy of unemployment increases the general level of income inequality in most countries and produces social exclusion that exacerbates interracial and interethnic tensions. It has a negative impact on technological change, um, innovation, and output, and is a contributing factor to financial crises and economic instability, as well as to, po to political instability, human trafficking, forced child labor, exploitation, and slavery. As if that were not enough, unemployment also depresses um, economic growth. In the midst of the Great uh, Recession, according to one estimate, the U.S. economy lost 10 billion of output each day as a result of high levels okay, of unemployment. Each day. 
That, folks, is $3 trillion a year. Now, I'm going to multiply $10 billion by 365. $3 trillion of output per year. For comparison purpose, this amount is equal to the annual budget of the Environmental Protection Agency for 2016. Even at the peak of expansion in 2007, when unemployment was relatively low, the daily GDP loss from unemployment was around $500 million. In other words, we give up millions of dollars of goods and services every day while carrying the enormous personal, social, and economic cost of unemployment because we have accepted it, because we have accepted it as natural, unavoidable, and necessary. Unemployment is already paid for. We forfeit the social and economic value we could generate by eradicating it while carrying its real and financial costs. It's a global problem with global implications. It is a cancer linked to the gradual ruin of communities, the collapse of the social fabric, the opioid um, um, epidemic, poor child health and education outcomes, overcrowded prisons, uh, mental and um, health deterioration, uh, to name just a few of its overwhelming effects. These are unnecessary costs. Most of them could be avoided with the program. And that guarantees a basic living wage job to all. A broken status quo policy responses. Even central banks with a dual mandate prioritize fighting inflation over fighting unemployment. And if the policy priorities were uh, reversed, there's little reason to believe they could pin the unemployment rate at the desirable level, much less create conditions where someone who sought work could find it. What central banks could do for the labor market is adopt a do-no-harm approach. Abandon the Nairu and stop pumping the brakes on the economy in order to slow job growth. As the next chapter will make clear, there are no economic, social, or moral reasons for using the unemployed as a bulwark against inflation. Fiscal policy hasn't done a good job of tackling unemployment either, even though it has more tools at its uh, disposal. It was demoted in the post-Reagan uh, era and paired with deregulation, wage suppression, and trickle-down policies that, uh, that masqueraded as sound economic policy. The result was the greatest transfer of wealth uh, to the top and the slowest payroll employment recovery rates, uh, rates in the post-war period. But the earlier post-war Keynesian fiscal policies did not do the trick either. Government stimulus policies failed to generate the conditions that would ensure a job for every job seeker. Fiscal pump um, 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 priming typically prioritizes stabilizing investment over stabilizing employment. And the latter being uh, regarded as a byproduct of the former. This is done via loan, loan guarantees or contracts or guaranteed profit subsidies and bailouts. Indeed, fiscal policies often help stabilize and increase corporate profits in the midst of a recession, whereas jobless uh, recoveries have become the norm. By contrast, the job guarantees a straightforward response, the policy solution to someone unable to find work is to provide them with an employment um, opportunity. <laughs> common sense, pure common sense. Uh, yeah, uh, but today, a guaranteed retirement income, public education have become fundamental components of the policy landscape. Just as we do not target either some natural rate of retirees who are uninsured or a certain uh, illiteracy rate, it makes little sense to target a given rate of involuntary unemployment. In a sense, the government chooses the unemployment rate by insisting that uh, the NIRU must serve as a policy guide. Even the uh, presumed uh, benefits of managing inflation by taming changes in demand do not justify keeping people out of work. As the next chapter will explain, the job guarantee replaces the NIRU with a powerful automatic stabilizer that um, 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 actually delivers full employment and price stability. It also brings a range of economic and social benefits without inflicting 
the unbearable costs of unemployment on society. So I will stop here for tonight and move to your comments. Uh, and next time, tomorrow night, we'll be moving to chapter three. Oh, I do want to call your attention to a reference here. Reference 21 to uh, D. Stuckler and S. Uh, Basu. That book, The Body Economic, Why um, um, Austerity Kills, is an indispensable book. Get that book. Once you read it, you will never forget it. And then think about what we've done to Russia. After you read that book, think about what happened um, to Russia when the Soviet Union collapsed and what role we, our people, our economists, had in that. And then think about our foreign policy towards Russia since that time. indispensable book okay we'll deal with chapter three next time and i expect with chapter four too chapter three is the job guarantee a new social contract and macroeconomic model so that's what you have to look forward to for tomorrow night. Uh, for the rest of tonight, I will go over your comments. Joanne says, unemployment numbers don't count the homeless or those who don't qualify for unemployment. No, they don't. They don't. Uh, that's why I like to talk about the disemployed. Avramano says, I read a headline a little while ago that said um, Donald Trump will have to end up paying people to go to work due to COVID. That's kind of a little bit like uh, the FJG. Well, not really, because uh, the FJG is purely voluntary. It doesn't operate um, 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 but through use of uh, trying to coerce people uh, to go to work. Um, Avramano says, but FJO, Joanne says to Avramano, but FJG covers all the unemployed too. Avril says, yeah, that's why I said kind of. <laughs> Avril says, it's damn sure helping Boeing. Very Kennedy-esque. Kay says, well-paying job with Medicare for all. Joanne says, wages for low-paid workers would have to rise or people can choose not to work. Avril says, not a slave wage guarantee. Avril says, thanks, I already know. Joanne says, oh, no error loading. Lisa Alagato says, green jobs to improve our environment, clean our oceans, and protect, conserve our national treasures, create better transport, uh, water delivery, energy transfer instead of dangerous um, nuclear aging power lines, transportation. Uh, yes, Lisa, that okay, is right. But though there are many of the jobs in the job guarantee program will be green, there are also green jobs that are not considered temporary or transitional, but um, the permanent jobs, the stable jobs, um, those jobs will not be part of the job guarantee program, but they will be part of, uh, okay, if they're public jobs, they'll be part of the permanent uh, civil service. In other words, two different kinds okay, of jobs, and the pay scale would be entirely different. As you'll see as we go into future chapters, the job guarantee program is about 
um, transitional jobs. Now, people could move from the job guarantee program into permanent uh, uh, public jobs that can, are green jobs or green jobs that are in the private sector as well. Alvaro Romano says, my grandma mom said they had CWEP when she was in high school, which was a federal guarantee for teenagers. Avril says, federal job guarantee correction. Case says, if we had one of these corporations, one of these corporations would go broke, laugh out loud. Paul says, you'll come to it, but I love this section, Boone to the service sector, pages 60 to 62. It helps with the response to some um, um, frequently leveled um, criticisms. Well, I've already come to 60 to 62. I've read the whole book, and I like that section, too. It's a terrific section. We will come to it most probably next time, tomorrow, tomorrow night. Kay says, we need to build affordable housing, too, with the FJG. Stephanie says, finally done sharing, um, but many groups have gone private. Most of them need uh, admin approval. Okay, for tomorrow, Stephanie, uh, if you need uh, the admin approval, it might be help to point out that the job guarantee is one of the signature policies in Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal. So Sandy, say, Sandy says, hello, shared. Thank you, Sandy. In case says, the usual wait time for affordable housing is two years or more now almost everywhere. That is unacceptable. It is absolutely unacceptable. How can the FJG get around all the rules and regulations that okay, neoliberal has succeeded um, in making legislation to serve them, like part-time and full-time? Um, but what if someone can work only two hours if they have a heart condition, for example? <coughs> I think the FJG can get around that. It doesn't have to square with private sector rules, okay, and regulations for work. Steve DeVore says, hi, everyone. Hi, Steve. Okay, he says, hi, Stephen. Steve Gonzo says, hashtag MMT plus hashtag FGJ, FJG equals hashtag um, M for all plus hashtag social security expansion plus um, um, education for all plus hashtag child care plus hashtag infrastructure plus um, hashtag military industrial complex, etc. Yeah, Steve, there are a lot of hashtags involved there. Sandy says hi, Stephen. Steph says hi, Stephen. Steph says sharing to groups I missed. Okay, finally done sharing. Laugh out loud. Wow, Steph. Boy. Steve says, hi, ladies. I hope you're both doing well tonight. Kay says, good enough here, Steve. Hope you're doing okay, too. Avro says, I like $20 an hour plus. Yeah, me too. Steve says, well enough for now. With at least $20 an hour, the poor might actually be able to afford rent. Yeah, $20 an hour is, uh, what is it? Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Forty-three, forty-four thousand a year, something like that. Close to four thousand a month. Yeah, in 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 a good many cities, the Ford, uh, the poor might be able to afford rent, but in those cities, since it would be cost adjusted for the cost of living, in those cities, it would be more than twenty dollars an hour. Steve says the minimum wage would be around 20 to 22 bucks an hour for today's economy. Well, as I said, I think the low minimum wage should be at $20 an hour, and it should be cost adjusted up from there for higher cost of living areas. I was says corporations are going to sure enough bribe politicians so that the FJG doesn't pass, even if they have to collaborate and start its communism movement by propaganda and sabotage. Sure enough, going to bribe, but we're going to fight for it, aren't we? Many jobs lost um, due to the virus will never come back, and that's another reason why we're going to need a federal job guarantee. What's the minimum wage now? Around seven twenty-five an hour, something like that. Is nothing but starvation and homeless wages. A couple working three jobs can barely afford um, basic living expenses. 
uh, by Medicare needs to be raised too in food stamps. Um, they need to be redone and taken, taken out of that fund as well. It needs to be a separate entity on the bill. Even when it says, who can find anything wrong with this FJG unless they're just plain misanthropes. A lot of misanthropes out there, Evelina. Evelina says, crying shame. Avril says, not having to commute back and forth to work is a blessing in disguise for the planet and those that can work from home. Evelina says, I'd just be able to work local. Steve says, for a couple of years, I lived across the street from my job. It took me longer to drive than it did to walk. It was so much nicer than fighting traffic for an hour each day. All the commuting time is a waste of life and precious time. Steve, it is. Kay says, exactly, Steve. <clears throat> Avril says, Stephen DeVore, heck yeah, you're dead tired from commuting before you even get to work and too tired to eat when you finally get home. After that job, driving even 20 minutes to work seemed like such an imposition on my time. Kay says, this country needs way more parks and green spaces. I'd love to find something to do in that field, especially if I could walk to work. It needs way more parks and green spaces, but it also needs way more jobs in rural areas so people could live okay, in rural areas. And jobs that can be done over the internet, of course, can be started in rural areas. And federal job guarantees can be started in rural areas also. And so people could have those jobs okay, in rural areas. Stephanie says, 243 shares, good job, loves. <laughs> yeah, great job, loves. That's wonderful. That's fantastic, Steph. Fantastic. 243 jobs. I mean, shares, that's incredible. That's incredible. Steve says, come to Chicago, parks are everywhere. Avril asks, community garden, yes, that too, Avril. Avril says, see, 21 chimed in. How many do you all see? Stephanie says, 20. Steve, no money to move anywhere right now. $676 a month doesn't go too far. No, it doesn't go too far. But if you, if you knew you had a job waiting at the other end, Will there then be money to move? Steve says, I haven't been out since the first. Four excess total since 313. Out of about everything. CV spikes have me spooked. Oh, I know. The CV spikes have everybody spooked. Uh, we go out to shop for food. And pretty much the rest of the time we're in, that we can possibly be in. Avril says up to 25 now. Stephanie says a lot of groups have gone private. Avril posts are probably sitting there waiting on approval. Steve says, I tried to get a garden near my building. You'd think I was asking for a personal loan. Did I get blowback from that? Time to vote those people out. Yeah. Amazing. Avril said same Lana said, that's very sad. Steph says, I have a mono, but tomorrow I'm sure the views will have skyrocketed. I know I shared over 100 groups, most needed approval, so fingers crossed. Steve says, novel, swine virus being monitored as possible second pandemic by a BBC. It's the swine flu? It's a novel swine virus? Oh, my God. Sandy says, yes, very good. Avril says, um, um, MMTs is slang. We're not MMTs, we're MMTers. Sorry. We are MMTers. And we've been slaying for a long time, but people haven't been listening for a long time. We've been slaying for a very, very long time. Unemployment is very depressing. I've been there a few times. Very stressful in an FKG, but not a perfect or a long-term solution would be very welcome. It sure would. Steve DeVore says, same here. The only reason I go out is for doctor's appointments and groceries. Maybe six times in the last four months. Yeah, that's the way it is for us too. Steve, it's really wonderful to do these live streams. <laughs> Steve, who are you calling us? Why? 
Ken says, I saw a post from some group saying that China now has a new swine flu that could become a pandemic. SMH, I wonder if this crap will ever end. We need to rebuild. We need to rebuild a Mother Earth right now. We do, Kay, but about China, if they have the swine flu, they will very rapidly contain it. And then we will botch up containment again. This has really got to stop. We got to start handling these things again. Sandy says they need to get rid of those wet markets. Steve says it is the year of the pig after all. It's not what they need to do so much as what we need to do. We need to have public health here that works, that has a priority that can stop these things in their tracks. It's not so hard. Taiwan did it. 24 million people live in Taiwan. South Korea has pretty much done it. There have been a few spikes there, but they've pretty much done it. New Zealand has done it. Australia has done very well. They have an appreciable population too. If South Korea with 51 million people can do it, we can do it with our 330 million people. Stephen says, so many other shares as well. Uh, Real Progressives is live too. Our numbers were higher last time I checked, but not sure now. I think I saw a couple of other popular live streams, so we're all basically in competition for views right now, so it definitely should get better in views by tomorrow. Steve says, with the temperatures warming up, I think viruses are going to become more common than not. Scary stuff. At least that's what I've been reading about uh, lately. Emma says, yeah, China needs to take food prep courses or something. They're having that disgusting dog eating festival again. Dogs are way filthier than pigs. I can't imagine eating them without some horrible outbreak upcoming eventually. Kay says, I agree, Sandy, but the crap is caused by loss of habitat for animals and overbuilding of hard space. I've also said, sorry, aggressive autocorrect is causing errors. Steve, we must be reading the same things. I've also said, wait till the ice sheets melt and releases those ancient bacteria and viruses. There'll be nurse and doctor jobs to fill everywhere. Sandy says, the world is becoming a giant cesspool. Okay, says 105 degrees in the Arctic is very bad. In Siberia, that was just the constant overheating and failing to control parasites and bacteria. Arrow says it is failing. Evelina says never knew it could even reach 105 in the Arctic. Evelina, nobody else knew that too. This is the first time that we've had it 105 in the Arctic. K. Clark Ryan, that is really scary. K. Clark Ryan says started back in May this year. Evelina, I follow all the climate change and echo groups. It was measured in Siberia, from what I understand, have read. Stephanie says, hey, Charles. Is Charles Lovett here? Stephen says, how have you been doing, Charles? Stephen says, and all the permafrost, once that the frost said we're going to see illnesses we thought were dead for millions of years. They say it will start to happen in many areas within our lifetime. There's nowhere to run and hide from that. Rich or poor, Democrat or Republican will all become victims of global warming. That's not counting on what seed level rise will do. Personally, I'm scared for the future, especially knowing of all the idiots out there who don't act on um, the rationally in a crisis. Me too, Steve. We have known this would happen since at least 1970. We just let it happen. Yeah, we knew it. We knew it. We didn't do anything about it. Mine says, okay, I'm no dog eater, but just remember the Native Americans ate dogs and didn't seem to have a COVID problem. Not sure what the answer is. Well, maybe the Native Americans had a, a relatively low enough density population that that was a barrier against uh, the spread of disease. Lana says, oops, I meant to direct that to Carmen. Steve says, I've got three some pressing issues to discuss the voice here today. Seven days and two taps, I still won't go. Laugh out loud. Luckily, only lasted a week. The new normal is going to suck. Kay says, I never heard about natives eating dogs. They took care, cave Mother Earth. 
Oh, uh, Stephanie asks, a lot of Dell, really? They ate dogs? A lot of Dell, maybe stop eating meat? Uh, which Steve is wearing a bra? We know one is pregnant from time to time. <laughs> Oh, Bonnie's here tonight. She's here. She's watching. Sorry, I lost track of the scroll, folks. I'm going back to it. Yeah. I think this discussion is getting a pretty... <laughs> it's getting pretty wild now. Avril says, Alana Dell, maybe stop eating meat could be an answer. Stephanie says, well, that austerity does kill. Well, it says, no, people are not going to stop eating meat. It's not the answer. Avril says, take vitamin C in cloves. I make tea from cloves on my coffee maker and add orange, then use the cloves directly, unaffected dental pain infection. Clothes are only 79 cents in the Latin section. Lana says, uh, uh, okay, says to Lana, uh, sustainable local farms would be a big improvement, though. They would be. Sandy says, Steve, if that infection goes into your bra, that could be very sad. <laughs> Sandy says, brain, not bra. <laughs> I found that. Sandy says, although that could be bad, too. Stephanie says, lots of comments tonight, some good conversations. I found out things I wasn't aware of. Priceless conversations tonight. Lana says, that's why I said an answer. And Stephen Dvorak says, Steve, I'm still walking around, but I'm waiting for the shoe to drop on me. I have some very serious health issues that aren't going to get fixed by modern medicine. From kidney disease to lung cancer, my days are pretty much numbered. I still don't know how I feel about all of it, except I'm getting sick of seeing doctors who don't have any answers for me. Stephanie says, Sand Sandy Digg, oh my God, good correction, laugh out loud. Kay says, for profit, sick care sucks the armor last. Where's Bonnie tonight? She's here. In fact, it's Bonnie's birthday tonight. And Nikki said, did you see the article in the Hill about the world? Lydia's talking about a global financial reset and advocating for Bernie's platform. No, I haven't seen that yet, but I'll certainly look at it. COVID-19 is helping um, evolution from greed to community. And Nikki leaves the link to the Hill article for us. Thank you, Nikki. Kay says... I only go for food, too, and I hate that. And laugh out loud. Lana says, uh, more regulation for foreign meat and get rid of factory farms in the U.S. The animals are mistreated and bad for the planet. Small family farms that are organic and regulated for more local consumption is my best thought at the moment. It's a good thought, Lana. Lana says, thank you, Kay. Great minds think alike. Exactly, Dr. Joe. Yes, we do, Lana. Too bad um, that no one is listening to us. Laugh out loud. Arvel says, plant-based foods like that, impossible meat stuff. Prices need to become lower than meats. People will change their consumption, is my view. Some consumption will change. <laughs> yeah. And Dolores says, happy birthday, Bonnie. Happy birthday, Bonnie. Dolores wishes you a happy birthday. Avril says, looks like election year Russia gating propaganda is back. Yeah, I noticed. What nonsense. I, for one, am not falling for the disinformation. Me neither. It's all bullshit. Also, uh, you know, when you think about it, okay, uh, you know, when you think about it, in the 1980s, when Russia was fighting in Afghanistan because they were trying to control Afghanistan. 
What did we do? We supported the people who became the Taliban because we wanted Afghanistan to be Russia's Vietnam. We supported them with arms, with money, with aid, and we're with the CIA. What did we support them to do, people? What did we support them to do? We supported them to kill Russian soldiers. Did we not? Did we not? Uh, did Russia start a war with us over that? I don't think so. But what I'm saying is, as a routine matter, we pay people to kill the soldiers who are soldiering for regimes we do not like. We've been doing that in Venezuela this year. We do that in the Middle East on a routine basis. We've done it in Eastern Europe. My only point is if it's okay for us to do it, why isn't it okay for the Russians to do it too? It's just reciprocal behavior. If we want the behavior to stop, we can't go around, we can't go around uh, killing Russian soldiers or paying um, other people to fight Russian soldiers for us. So even if there's something to this, even if there's something to this, I certainly, I certainly do not want to start a war with Russia over it. Um, Evelina says, Feliz Complianos, Bani, which I think is happy birthday, Bonnie. <laughs> and Steve says, happy birthday, Bonnie. And Nikki says, happy birthday, Bonnie. And Stephanie says, I don't see the link to the article in the Hill. And Nikki says, here you go. Alvaro says, how much will you pay me to stomp grapes for your vino under the FJG? If stomping grapes for vino is defined by your local community as a job under the FJG, Avro, then... I will be happy for you to get the uh, the regular FJG rate for stomping grapes for my vino. Stephanie says, uh, could you send it to me in a PM, Nikki? I think we're friends on Facebook. And Nikki says, sure. Stephanie says, Nikki, thank you. Lana says, stick, happy birthday cake, Bonnie, says Avro. Lana says, sick of the Russia crap being dredged up again. And Avro says, contrived distractions and psyops. They are, they are, they're, you know, want to manufacture an election issue against Trump. Stephanie says, Lana Dell, amen, sister. Okay, folks, that's it. I've been through all. Oh, Bonnie wants to say something. Okay, you want to come over here, honey? No, it's just that um, I only want to say thank you for the birthday greetings. <laughs> I've had a wonderful two-day birthday. <laughs> 
Joe has been feeding me for two days. Really great food. Thank you, everyone. Uh, during the COVID-19 virus, um, happy birthdays are greatly facilitated by good food. <laughs> And also the selection of some good films as well. And also doing some good uh, live streams. Sputnik reported the Taliban disclaimed that news. They said uh, the U.S. annoyed, okay, is annoyed by Russia. I was annoyed by Russia mediating in peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghanistan government. And that's probably the truth. That's probably what it is. Yes. Yeah, the Russians want back in to Afghanistan, and we don't like it. Dolores says, thank you and good night, all. Lana says, you guys are so cute. Well, thanks, Lana. Thank you. <laughs> And so how nice. Um, but glad you had a great one, Bonnie. In case it's glad to hear that, Bonnie. Avril says, Consortium News did a good article about the new Russia gating disinformation. Okay, I gotta go there, okay, and look it up. They usually do good stuff about that kind of thing. Avril says, My pleasure, Bonnie. And Stephen says, good live stream tonight, Dr. Joe. Good to see everyone tonight. Um, everyone have a good night. Yeah, everyone have a wonderful night. We'll see you all tomorrow. We're going to have another great stream tomorrow. Please come and please share and please have a good time. Ending now.